The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today, Peter Anthony, is a producer, psychic, and paranormal investigator, a contributing writer for several spiritual magazines across the country, and the author of Keymaster. He is, as well, a numerology life coach and a chaplain to the world of ghosts. Before his NDE, Peter had studied to become a special effects makeup artist. He rose quickly and was soon working with the who's who in showbiz as a freelance image consultant. But in 1987, the after effects of a near-death experience presented Peter with an inexplicable gift of mathematical codes. This life-changing event meant his artistic talents were replaced with arithmetical knowledge, allowing him to become an expert in numerology as well as an intuitive. In 1995, Peter's NDE gifted abilities landed him on the paranormal TV show Sightings, and from there he traveled extensively throughout America, working alongside a team of paranormal and forensic experts. As a psychic detective, Peter helped resolve forgotten murder cases, as well as exploring haunted houses, cemeteries, abandoned caves, and concentration camps. And as a result of this work, Peter has been featured on many TV and radio shows. Peter Anthony's book, Tour Across America, promoted IONS, and helped him to become, uh, led him to become a speaker for NDEers. And Peter's book, Keymaster, inspired by his own NDE, has been inducted into the Edgar Cayce, or Edgar Cayce Library and is under development for a film. Uh, the Keymaster offers a thought-provoking perspective with the intention of allowing the reader to discover wisdom from beyond. Peter Anthony's second book, The Accidental Prophet, is soon to be released. Peter, welcome to NDE Radio. Well, thank you guys so very much. And I have to say this to your listening audience. Um, you know, we all have choices and, you know, whatever choice you make when you listen to this, I say thank you because you are allowing me a moment of your life and a moment of my life so that we can kind of connect. And then I also say to you, Lee, thank you for doing this work because it allows so many of us who've had near-death experiences to get out and, and to share our words. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, well, you're very welcome, and thank you for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. Peter, in 1987, you were rushed to the hospital with what you've described as a burst intestine. I can only imagine the amount of massive infection that must have triggered in your body and uh, triggered as well your near-death experience. Um, you were unconscious for three and a half weeks. Tell us what you experienced during that time. Well, it's funny because so many people who uh, talk about that that state of unawareness during a coma or just being unconscious, um, I had a uh, a dear female uh, female friend of mine who, while I was uh, in intensive care, uh, would come to me and read to me. And uh, the doctors and nurses would make fun of her. And when I did regain my consciousness, I remembered much of what she shared with me. And part of that, uh, of my, uh, I guess, my fascination with numerology um, had to do with the numbers I saw on the other side. But for some reason, she was tuned into that, not knowing that I you know, had had these experiences with uh, with numeric codes and quantum physics. She would bring numerology books and teach me uh, the basic, you know, numbers one through nine and the basic understandings of astrology. Mm. So when I woke up, I retained all that. Wow. Well, tell us about uh, what you saw during your NDE. I know you talked about uh, first being outside your body and seeing that, and then uh, a rotating bullseye tunnel. What yeah, I call like? it the, yeah the bullseye. You know, the, it's you know you see this you know rotating. You know, <laughs> I should call it the love tunnel, but um, the uh, it's this rotating tunnel, and um, 
I guess when I finally got into the OR and I was in and out of consciousness, I had lost so much blood, um, mm. you know, from the summer up until November the 11th. And, you know, I had unfortunately uh, back during the AIDS epidemic back in 1987, there were so many people, medical crew who were afraid of me. So one of the uh, the nurses <laughs> was suited up like, you know, like, like I was radioactive and just left me in a hallway. Mm. And so I was there probably an hour and a half, if not longer, and basically bleeding to death. So when I got into the OR, finally, uh, I was – I was a goner. It was it was at that point in time uh, almost too late, and I think by the time they got the IVs in me, I, my veins had collapsed. And as I would was seeing myself go in and out of physical form to what I call spirit form, I could see this rotating tunnel, and I feel as though, and I say feel now, but I mean I felt then as though I a vacuum was attached to my solar plexus and I was being pulled into this bullseye. And I remember going through this bullseye, but before all that, I went into that tunnel completely. Uh, Peter Anthony in spirit form was looking down at Peter Anthony in physical form on the, on the operating table and everything went in slow motion. And I watched the medical doctors, you know, go into medical protocol and I could hear their thoughts and I could sense you know, the, the desperation. And, uh, when I finally did go into the tunnel, it was as though this, this, whatever was attached to my solar plexus, uh, almost snapped. I could hear this snapping like a, you know, like, like a hand or a thumb snapping. And then I remember being, you know, sucked into this, to this vibrating tunnel. Four things here. Besides mathematical codes, the, the triple codes and the quantum physics and geometry, I was seeing the 222s and 333s and the 444s and the 999s. Uh, part two of that, which I think is fascinating, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, I was being downloaded with so much information. And so I, I, I said on a radio interview not too long ago, you know, I was able, if you had to kind of compare it to anything, reading the Bible from start to finish and digesting every bit of it. Mm-hmm. And so here I am downloading the mind of, uh, uh, say, Tesla and Einstein and uh, your English professor, uh, you know, your, your, you know, my art teacher. All this information from what I considered those people who were the experts, who were the geniuses of our, of our planet, past and present, was being downloaded into my consciousness. Part of that, part three of this consciousness was that while I was spinning into the, uh, into this tunnel, uh, I, and so many talk about this in their near-earth experience, you feel this overwhelming sense of peace, of love, of compassion, and I, I tell so many different people that your mindset is not that of a, 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 a that of, a, of human form because you're not in human form as much as you are in spirit or, or the essence of a spirit form. And as this information is coming your way, you don't question, you don't doubt, you accept and you allow. Mm. And I think that's the most important thing because I have so many people from all around the world who email me and, and uh, so many messages on Facebook and – you know, they have this, you know, God as a certain mindset, and what people don't understand, the mindset is beyond human, and and I think that um, if we think like humans, you would understand the mindset of God, and so for me to understand the, the mindset of God, I had to allow, and not, at, again, obviously you're in, in, in spirit form, you, you're, you don't think like a human, you think in frequency thought patterns. And that's what I was experiencing with these codes. I was digesting, understanding, and allowing these codes to to be a part of the process. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the life review, which I think for so many of us is is altering, is is life altering because this is important. Uh, zero to sixty, um, your your whole life review is based upon what you did, what you didn't do, what you could have done, and I always say the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, and there is no judgment. And I want to be real clear to the, your to your listening audience and those who are tuning in for the first time uh, regarding near death experiences. There is no judgment. For century after century after century, we've been taught to judge. We have been taught to have opinions. We've been taught to categorize. You know, when you're on the other side, you know there is no Christian, there is no Muslim, there is no black, there is no white. You know, there is no gay, there is no straight. There is there is no wealthy, there is no poor. There is the essence of spirit, and as you're spinning through this tunnel, that essence is that of love. 
And mm -hmm. so when you are looking <laughs> at your life review, you're not judging it. You're not saying to myself, oh, my God, what a horrible human being I am. I'm so sorry I should have done this. You don't do that. What you do is you look upon your life review and you – in this very loving, kind way that you would to your best friend, or even that matter of, you know, when you're talking to your animal who's pooed on the floor, you wouldn't scold as much as, but you, you, you know, you think in terms of the spirit world, I could have done better. Yeah. You mentioned one moment uh, with your sister at mm -hmm. the locker that you regretted <laughs> because you kind of blew her off, but later that night she had been. She was killed by a drunk driver. Right, yeah. And you, you felt that as a terribly missed opportunity. Well, you know, when you're looking down at this, you know, and you see yourself, you know, and again, you see yourself with such compassionate eyes. Again, no judgment. But what I learned from that, you know, not saying to my sister on my birthday, um, you know, I love you. I mean, she, I mentioned to you when we had our conversation prior to this to this interview yes. um, that we were in an orphanage, and my brother and my sister and I, we were we were each other's family. Mm -hmm. And so when I lost my sister to a drunk driver, you know, that whole feeling of should have said this, you know, what I learned from that experience, and those who know me and know me well, I mean, when I end my conversations with people, I say how much I love them. Um, and it's not that I go back and hold guilt about that, that I didn't say that I love you. But for me, the experience of that is to show people that I love them because it's a beautiful thing to to, uh, I, I guess, to say to someone. And, you know, we don't have we don't have any guarantees. And I learned that myself. You know, we come in and we leave. And uh, and I think for me, I live every day as though today is my last day. So I live it fully. And so when I talk to my friends and and uh, uh, I have a stepbrother. I mean, I, 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 I mentioned that I love you and it comes from the most purest place. And I mean that. So it's an opportunity that allows me to continue that, that what I saw on the other side. Right. Now you mentioned also that, um, at some point you saw a tree with either <laughs> an, an old man or an angel sitting in it. Tell, tell us about that and what that might've meant. For me, and I, I say it was an ascended masters, and I, you know, I, I for some, I say this, and I, I, I sometimes upset the angelic, the angelical community, uh, or the Christian community, or uh, re religious community. You know, they say, "Oh, you did, you, you that was Jesus." Well, I don't know that it was Jesus. I can't say because he's, you know, it's not like he sat on the tree with me and going, you know, "Hey, my name is Jesus, and we're going to talk about this, that, and the other." It didn't happen that way. But again, when I say sit in the tree. I wasn't sitting there with my, my legs dangling. I was sitting in this tree or witnessing the tree from an ethereal sense, from a, mm. a, a, this, this, this sense of spirit. And I could sense this, this energy field around me, male energy, golden frequency, and it was male for sure. And I was there, and I say to Ascended Master, maybe it was Jesus, maybe it was an angel, maybe it was, you know, my God, who knows what it was. I don't like to, to put it in a category, but for me, it was profound. And I go back to this tree, and many people make fun of me for bringing up this tree, but I learned later on when I finally started speaking to IONS, it was Dennis Purcell, who was the, uh, the facilitator of the Los Angeles IONS group, who explained to me that was the tree of life. Well, I never heard of the tree of life. Um, but when he said that to me, that resonated within so deeply in my soul and my spirit, and I accepted that because it felt right to me. So as I'm sitting here with this, this male energy, the conversation that went on between the two of us, again, from spirit to spirit, was telepathic. Wow. I'm going to have to send you a copy of my novel, which has got a lot about the Tree of Life in it. Oh, really? Yes. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, did you have a conversation with uh, with um, whoever it was sitting in the, the tree? The Ascended Master I, I referred to. I did, actually. And, what, what, you know, what did you talk about? Well, it wasn't so much what we what I spoke. You know, it's like you know, we're not having a, a typical conversation, like I said, that you and I are having. We go back to that mindset of God or the Ascended Master. You know, it's beyond that way of thinking. For me... It was looking at my, I call human error. So many people speak of sin. I don't look at at at, at 
people and and sin as 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 a category, but where we didn't shine, where we weren't our best spirit. And so for me, when I got a chance to see my 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 human era, um, you know, there was this. It was almost as though. <sighs> Uh, my grandmother was such a loving, compassionate woman, and there was no, there never was judgment with her. She just made you want to, to to do better, just by being in her presence. So I can only tell you this: that that experience on the other side with this ascended master multiplied that by one million times. I just wanted to do better, not for his sake but for my sake. So the conversation that did take on was as I l- reviewed my 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 life and 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 these moments, these moments that we that we do experience. I think so many times for us who had near death experiences, you know, I go 0 to 60, every moment is recorded. It's as though there is a matrix and those moments that I had forgotten about, those conversations uh in the park, uh the young boy that I played with when I was 5 years old, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Bellamy, um, you know, my uh, conversations, excuse me, my heated conversation with with Cable because I felt the bill was too, you know, was too high. All those moments in life, I got a chance to, to see or to witness where I didn't shine. And I use the Cable because I think oftentimes for me, when I'm having this conversation with the credit card company or the Cable or whatever that that conversation is, and it's almost like talking to the DMV, they don't care, and mm-hmm. you find yourself rising that, to that moment of frustration, uh, I go back to that moment of my near-death experience and recall those moments where I didn't shine. And so when I find myself going down that rabbit hole of emotion, I take a deep breath and just allow the conversation to continue. And um, so I've learned so often times that for me, my life review wasn't so much about, you know, it's not that I murdered someone. It's not like I, you know, robbed a bank. (laughs) Those moments were in the car with me speeding down the highway, uh, going down rush hour traffic, downtown Los Angeles on a Friday afternoon. And so I learned very quickly coming back that, I think our higher consciousness is, is kind of indicative of where we are at five o'clock rush hour traffic on Friday. And so I'm reminded of that and I really try to be a better driver. And that mm-hmm. sounds kind of juvenile, but when you tackle those smaller moments in your life, when those bigger moments of frustration and anger and, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, an example, dealing with your boss or, or betrayed relationship, you learn to come from a different place. Right. Now you, uh, described um, possibly going through the bardo, something uh, uh, toward God, and then uh, encountering a, an entity uh, that was like gold fragments of light. Right. What was, what was that well, about? I, I call this, and for those who are Catholic, you'll understand this. For those who are Buddhist, you'll understand this. It's a place called Bardo. Now, I didn't know it was Bardo. Um, when I came back from my near-earth experience, I began to do lots of research, and it wasn't until pff, probably a couple of years ago that I learned this place called Bardo. But Bardo, I call it the cleansing station. But Bardo is after you've experienced your life review, you go to the next level. And Bardo is like purgatory. It's like limbo. And I got a chance to have this conversation uh, with this – imagine – us, the solar sun, the the, and but in itself, it's nothing but fragments of 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 currency, electrical currency, uh, fragments of gold light, and this conversation I was having with this advanced being, much more I think than the the man on the on the tree, uh, but this was a, 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 I can't even begin to explain this. I I say it was my conversation with God, because what happened was. Though this presence was in front of me, I could feel the essence of of, of magnetic, magnetic energy frequency coming in from my back, but of course I'm not in physical form, coming in and going through my solar plexus. And what happened, I was able to, I guess like a, a zoom lens, to look down at Mother Earth and to look at – you know uh, the our animal kingdom i see the pollution i you know you watch that one of those youtube videos i could see that we were so eager to put people in power who were so eager to take our power away um and it's not again we go back to judgment it's not that i was judging but what i was seeing and understanding was that 
everything on Mother Earth is connected to source, is connected to one. You, me, the planet, the rocks, the ocean, the animal kingdom, the trees, the roots of the tree, everything, sand, everything is one. And when we are not taking care of Mother Earth, we are not taking care or coming to the place of a higher consciousness to God. And so as I'm looking down at this and seeing, as I said, the massacre of the dolphin and what they were doing to, to horses in the Everglades and, and dogs and cats, and then also I got a chance to witness war and, and, the, and the depreciation of Mother Planet. And I remember, and I'm having this conversation with this fragment of, 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 of energy, I said, this is not what God intended. And for me, that was an epiphany. That was a moment of an awakening because, you see, prior to my near-death experience, I was agnostic. I was a former Catholic. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in Jesus. I didn't believe in any of this stuff because I felt it was – it just didn't make sense to me, and I questioned and so while I'm having this conversation with what I refer to as God, and people ask me, do I believe in God? Absolutely. I remember saying that this is not what God intended. So as I accelerated around the planet, again, like a zoom lens, I began to realize that when I came back and, and, and processed this information of seven years, I became an activist for the planet, the animal kingdom. And for those people who are abused and for the poor. And for me, that made my that, – that I felt like I had an authentic purpose by doing so. Does that answer your question? Yes. Well, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do, uh, <laughs> um, now, you got a, a glimpse of your future life, which was yes. – I mean – it was not a. It was not going to be a perfect uh, ongoing existence for you back on Earth. Did they give you a choice as to whether to stay or go? I was given a choice, and I remember the voice said to me, "Do you want to go back?" And here again, think of yourself in spirit form. You know, look at just just use the movie uh, or film as as an example. We go to black space. You know, we cut to black, and all you hear is a voice. And, and you hear two voices having a conversation. And again, the big screen is nothing but a black screen. And, you know, now we cut to, you know, uh, the planet. You're seeing all this – I call the persecution from the planet. And I was able to see not only the medical complications and the attempted suicide and the lost relationships uh, and the not fitting in and the isolation, but I also saw myself no longer stuttering. I also saw myself traveling around the planet. I also saw myself helping children. I almost I saw myself adopting animals from kill shelters, and that gave me a sense of purpose. So when I did come back, um, knowing what I knew, it didn't matter because to me there was the finish line. There was the, the end result, and that motivated me. I also saw my ability as an artist to fade away, and I, when I came back into the real world, I was obsessed with math. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah. The uh, the other thing that I <clears throat> was struck with was your intuitive understanding that the medicines they were giving you in the hospital were poisoning you, and that what you really needed were vitamins and um, <clears throat> natural uh, healing um, substances. Remedies, and, yeah, yeah, really. Um, talk a little about that, and oh, oh, and also tell us wh what kind of a reception you got when you tried to tell people about your NDE? Well, I'll tackle the first question, uh, meaning you know, the, my reception with the, the medications. And again, seeing this on the other side, I knew when I came back, when I got out of ICU, when I was out of my unconscious state, um, you know, I, I could taste the medicines. I could feel the surgery inside of my stomach. I could feel the scars and the, and 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 the uh, uh, even I could still feel the surgery knives inside of my anal tract. And um, so imagine I think you know smelling the drugs in your system and knowing that they're poisoning you. And so when I would when I did eventually wake up. Um, I immediately started talking to the doctor. Now, for me, my my aha moment was, you know, I had a speech impediment, so I was always the one who didn't want to speak up because I was afraid people would make fun of me. Mm -hmm. And so I spoke freely, uh, and I began to question, you know, uh, the the prednisone, the high doses of prednisone. I began to question the the uh, the morphine. I began to question, you know, the the cortisone, uh, everything, the the sulfur drugs that were feeding me. I could feel in my system 
as a almost as a newborn baby that it was poisoning my system. And the doctors would look at me and, and, and the nurses would look at me like I was a nut job. But I think the doctor was fascinated that how did I know? Because obviously I was in, you know, unconscious, but I could tell him where my hemoglobin levels were. I could tell him what my blood count was. I could tell him, you know, the doses of prednisone. I didn't even know what, to, you know, looking back, I didn't know what prednisone was and why mm. and, and the effects of it. So I was talking to this doctor as though he was, you know, like he was, you know, uh, 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 you know, that I was a doctor. So it's not that I meant to insult him, but I knew I had a mission ahead of me. And the longer he kept me under these medicines, the, the, the longer it was going to take me to recover. So um, I had work to do. And and then again, I wasn't welcomed by the the medical community. I think the biggest problem that so many of us who've had near death experiences that what we, you know, the isolation and the you know the medical industry or business is not taught how to deal with people who've had near death experiences. Number one, medications. Number two, to come back and talk about like I did my conversation with God. You know, they look at you as though, you know, the the medicines they're giving you are are, are creating hallucinations. So I, I wasn't welcome down that that particular alley. But the longer I spoke, um, the longer, you know, I excuse me, the more I spoke, I, I think there were just there was a nurse who would listen to me. And um, and then when my own doctor came in to see me, he was he was the one that let me know that I had a near death experience. He didn't call it a near death experience. He said we lost you uh, uh, for for several minutes, but you're here now. So he called me his miracle patient. So uh, I think for me the most important thing that I learned from the medical uh, field to this day is that I think that if they deal so much in data. You know the processing of data. You know uh, proof like math, like I deal with, you know, with you know with, you know the analysis of math. One and two equals three, and so I think f for the medical community, I think what would be so beneficial is to teach, you know, the nurses and the staff and the interns. You know, if someone like myself has a conversation, at least listen, and mm. not judge us. Right. I I want to. Uh save a little time here to oh, talk sure, sure. about <laughs> to talk about ghosts and the yes. fact that you came back you could see ghosts in the hospital yes and um just just as a a, a little bit of background for our listeners in the middle ages the catholic church believed that purgatory was a place that it was right. a and uh to the 20th century popes like john paul ii and benedict they declared purgatory was not a place but a temporary condition of existence, mm. which says to me the world of ghosts. Uh, Pope Benedict said Catherine of Genoa described it as not a place but an inner fire, which means like a hang-up, something that's holding them, keeping them uh, from moving on to, to into the light. Now, you, you've been helping people like that along with your investigations into murders and all of the mm. really – interesting things that we should devote another program to at some time. But, but talk about purgatory and how, how you communicate with ghosts. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is I disagree with the inner fire. I'm going to talk about – it's called the inner world, and it's the thin veil. Within the thin veil, there are other dimensions within dimensions, and I think so many of us who've had near-death experiences, we are heightened. I mean, it's almost like the animal kingdom. You know, they, they are tuned in to the, the, magnet energy of the, the magnetic energy of, of Mother Earth. Well, I happen to be tuned in to frequency. I think part of my conversation with this, with this frequency on the other side – taught me how to tune in to these, uh, I guess, these other dimensions. And I think when I was on the uh, – I, th I say this. I don't think I understand that when ghosts were coming to me uh, when I was in the hospital after I had a – I got out of ICU, um, the nurses and the doctors who had passed before would show up in my room. Um, there's a movie called Ghost with Whoopi Goldberg and, and Patrick Swayze. I think this movie, though it was a comedy, a black comedy, has a lot more spot-on information uh, about the other side than most other movies and most other uh, you know, uh, series. Um, but for me, uh, this inner frequency has been the saving grace for me to help these, these spirits to cross over to the other side. Because like me and like so many of us who've had near-death experiences, they too want to get into the white light. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they have provided you with information in, in for example, uh, tracking down why they who might 
uh, possibly have murdered them, for example. Well, actually, it's all unresolved issues. And as I mentioned so many times in these interviews, you know, we have been, you know, conditioned by Hollywood. It's called the boo effect, you know, the conjuring and, and the nun and conjuring one, two, three and all these different, you know, the uh, Amityville horror. I'm not saying these things don't exist, but what I am saying is that m- most of the cases I worked on, 90 percent of the cases I worked on were nothing more than trapped spirits that wanted to go the other side. You know, normal people whose lives were cut short, who were just – who were held back. And my job was to have these conversations with these spirits and to help resolve the – I guess the the conflicts uh, that were not um, resolved and to explain to the the scientists and the, and the and the and the crew and the director and and those people on these different shows you know how these cases uh if they had been solved you know years ago or months ago or or decades ago you know if someone had the experience like so many of us who are uh good with spirit world uh help resolve these cases i think there would be less ghosts trapped on the planet mm. Your website provides some links to uh, YouTube's, uh, YouTube uh, interviews you've done. I would encourage people to go to your website. And uh, so why don't you tell the listeners how they can find your website and also uh, your book? Well, uh, my website is the, the www.theaccidentalprofit.com. So you can send me an email there or just contact me there, and I do respond. Uh, uh, and not rather quickly. I, I, I get a lot of emails daily. I, and also, Keymaster is on Amazon, and I always say Keymaster is like garlic. You either like it or you don't. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, um, and then my next book, which is the sequel to Keymaster, is called The Accidental Prophet. And I'm hoping to have this out by the summertime. And, um, and I think that so many readers will be so fascinated with this because not only do I go into – the near-death experience, but I go into grid work. I go into the animal kingdom. I go into spirits and the form, and I go into uh, so many different religions, and uh, and and um, I go into what I call the vortex, the the Sedona and uh, um, I call it vortex work. The Sedonas and the Maui's and the Mount Shastas and Stonehenge and all those different energy grids, where I make a pilgrimage every year on my birthday and go there and just spend. Uh, 29 days there and uh, aligning my grids so I can do work on the planet. So it's it's a powerful book. I'm very, very excited to have it out. Wow, I look forward to it. I love the Sedona area. I have a straw bale house out there myself in that general area. And uh, perhaps sometime you're out there, we could get together. Oh, I would love it. I, I'm, I'm, we'll see. I'm, I have a tentative hold on a booking in Sedona at the end of April, so we'll see if it confirms. But yes, I'll let you know. Okay. Perhaps we can have you back to talk more about uh, the world of ghosts and numerology, for that matter. Uh, We haven't covered that on the program at all, and I'd like to do that. But for now, let me thank you once again for sharing the story of your NDE and uh, how it influenced the direction of your life profoundly. If listeners would like to listen to this show again or any of our nearly 400 past shows, just go to NDE Radio and hit the Past Shows button for more information about IONS. Just click on their website, IANDS.org. And be with us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.